Okay, shall we start? Uh, hello, everybody. This is the 2023 BrainLink X-ray Dab talk concern on 6D semantic communication. Uh, I am Sung Ko from Inai University in South Korea. I'm an organizer with this program, and also I'd like to introduce the, another organizer, Professor Gino Che from Daking University in Australia. Uh, during last three days, we invite the famous researcher in the overseas university, uh, including the Hong Kong, Finland, and Australia, Italy, Japan, Singapore, and mainland China to have an in-depth discussion on the semantic communication. And uh, first of all, Professor Song Yun Kim in Yonsei University will give the summary of our three-day activity. 안녕하세요, 연세대학교 전자과의 김성윤 교수입니다. 반갑습니다. 지금 한국말로 하겠습니다. 그 지금 오늘 그 참석해 주지 못하셨는데 그 과기청 연합회 회장님이신 이태식 회장님 지금 국회에 계시다고 그래서 어 사실은 오셔서 이 브레인링크 사업 전체에 대한 소개가 어 있으셨어야 되는데 저도 그이 사업에 처음 참여를 했고 어 그래서 어떤 걸까 어 지금 평창에서 돌아오는 길에 생각을 해 보니까 그 이런 사람들이 모여서 어 나름대로 어떤 집단 지성 을 구성하면서 어, 어떤 토픽들에 대해서 결론을 나아가는 거라고 생각합니다. 그래서 제가 하고 있는 분야의 차세대 통신 분야에서 이런 일들이 별로 벌어지지 않고 있는데 그래서 그거를 저희들이 해 보았습니다. 그래서 어떤 내용인지 예, 말씀드리겠습니다. 여기 그 연사들로 오신 분, 분들은 지금 현재 그 국제적으로도 어, 어, 거의 탑에 가 계신 분들이고 또 여기에는 없지만 그 평창에 계셨던 국내 교수진들도 어, 정말 최고 교수진들이었습니다. 그래서 어, 저희들이 그 오랜만에 모여서 어, 분임 토의도 하고 어, 또 패널도 했었습니다. 그래서 너무 재밌었고 또 거기서 나온 결론들을 일부를 이제 여기서 소개를 하게 될것 같습니다. 어, 그렇지만은 교수들과 토론하는 것도 굉장히 중요했는데 지금 여기에도 일부 와 있는데 그 차세대 그, 이, 그 박사 과장들이 예, 굉장히 많은 그, 그 어떤 인사이트나 이런 걸 얻었을 거라고 어, 생각이 됩니다. 예, 시멘틱 어, 통신은 그 사실 우리말로도 번역이 아직도 안돼 있고 또 새로운 분야입니다. 그래서 어떻게 보면 은 어, 정보이론, 또 기계학습, 그 다음에 차세대 통신 이 분야에 좀 엮여져 있는 분야인데 저희들이 모여서 이걸 앞으로 10년 그 이후에 벌어질 이 6G 통신이라고 하는 그거에 어떻게 활용될 수 있을지 얘기는 했었고 다만 저희들의 논의가 굉장히 크로스드로 되어 있었기 때문에 저희들이 그 일부 이 분야에 영향을 줄수 있는 다른 분들을 또 초청을 해서 이 자리에서 다시 정리를 하도록 했습니다. 감사합니다. 이상으로 소개를 마치겠습니다. Thank you, Professor Sung Yun Kim. Okay, uh, next I will uh, introduce the, our invite speaker, and uh, after that we can hear, we can listen his their summary of their talk. So, firstly, Professor Fumiaki Adachi from Tohoku University. Please give, give a big hand. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm from Sendai, uh, Japan, and uh, I spent a beautiful two days uh, in Pyeongchang. Uh, so, uh, uh, semantic communication is uh, new to me, and uh, I, I, I did not much about uh, semantic communication, but uh, attending the, this workshop, I started to uh, understand more in detail about the uh, uh, importance of, uh, of the uh, semantic communication tools uh, in, in the era of uh, 6G. And uh, my, my uh, area of research is a physical area. So uh, during this, uh, these two days, I 
I, I have been uh, thinking about uh, how to contribute to support the 6G communication, uh, sorry, uh, semantic communications in 6G, and how to uh, modify or uh, change the, our physical layer of the mobile communication systems to efficiently provide such a new uh, communication services in 6G, uh, 6G era. Okay, so my talk today, uh, sorry, uh, summary of my talk uh, uh, in a uh, uh, workshop uh, is the uh, rec uh, reconfigurable user-centric radio access network, uh, which can support efficiently the 6G uh, semantic communications. Okay, so everyone knows uh, about uh, uh, how the uh, uh, mobile communications uh, advancing, has been advancing towards the uh, 5G and also the now many people are thinking about, uh, about uh, 6G communications. And uh, most important for us physical layer people is the uh, data traffic is increasing. Uh, recently also the about 30% per year. So that means that we have to prepare for the future. Uh, communication services uh, in the era of uh, 6G communications and also the new uh, communication services like uh, uh, semantic communications will be happening, uh, uh, say, attracting much attention. So we have to prepare from the perspective of uh, a physical layer. Okay, so uh, to uh, efficiently utilize the uh, limited frequency radio bandwidth, uh, we need to uh, uh, prepare for, uh, uh, say, develop a new technology, how to, uh, which can uh, if, uh, effectively uh, utilize the limited bandwidth, uh, and then uh, uh, provide the broadband communications as well as the uh, uh, mass, mass, uh, machine type communications, including IoT devices. And so, uh, 5G communications use the, uh, like, Five G communications use the uh, okay here uh, the beam forming and uh, uh, base station site. There is uh, massive antennas and to uh, uh, the generate the beams towards each user. So, but uh, uh, in the five G and also the six G, uh, we are going to use the utilize the uh, millimeter wave uh, because the vast amount of uh, uh, bandwidth is available, but uh, still not enough. But uh, uh, compared to sub six, uh, uh, sub six bandwidth, uh, uh, millimeter wave band has a vast amount of uh, bandwidth available. So, uh, but the problem is when using uh, this uh, types of uh, uh, massive beam forming uh, left side. Uh, which is used in uh, 5G communications. And uh, the, if there, is some, there are some uh, obstacles between the user and the ba uh, base station antenna, uh, here, like this, this is obstacle, sorry, uh, it's quite difficult <laughs> point. Okay, so then uh, beams cannot be arriving at the uh, uh, target user. So that's a problem. So uh, now we have been uh, working on the distributed beam forming uh, which is uh, this, uh, we deploy many, instead of uh, 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 co-located antennas like uh, left, left side, but uh, we distributed antennas like this. And then uh, there are many paths, uh, propagation paths towards target user. So one, uh, there, even though there are obstacles, uh, then uh, some, uh, there are some uh, paths, propagation paths exist uh, to support the, that user. So. So we call this a distributed massive MIMO uh, for uh, future mobile communications. And uh, so the how to generate, uh, how to uh, uh, utilize the uh, distributed antennas or distributed massive MIMO, uh, th that is a problem. So uh, we recently uh, working on the uh, uh, introduce the user clusters, which is uh, uh, which can be uh, uh, considered as, uh, as uh, uh, virtual small cells instead of uh, fixed uh, small cells. So based on the user location information, like uh, uh, this, sorry, the right side. 
Okay. So the one base station take care of all the uh, users inside each uh, each base station cell. So so this cluster uh, can be changed dynamically uh, according to the uh, this uh, change in a user location. Okay. So uh, we propose uh, uh, recently the architecture of the reconfigurable user-centric radio access network, which means the uh, uh, vast uh, wide area is divided into uh, the uh, base station cell and uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Okay, base station cell like this. And then within each cell, we uh, de uh, deploy the many antennas and then to form use, uh, virtual small cells, which is called the uh, user clusters. Okay, so then, uh, but uh, this is uh, not a fixed uh, um, base station cells. Also, of course, the, each cell is also configured by uh, uh, algorithm. Uh, which is a k-means algorithm uh, based on the antenna location information. So antenna location changed, and then a uh, 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 cell structure may change. So the, that's the reason why we call this reconfigurable user-centric uh, radio access network. Okay, so th then uh, uh, th this, uh, this is a uh, conceptual architecture of reconfigurable uh, user-centric radio access network and each base station there is a uh, radio access network controller which is called uh, uh, this according to the uh, ORAN uh, alliance and then uh, the, because of uh, each user cluster may change from time to time according to the user movement. So uh, near real time, we call this uh, leak uh, is necessary to take care of this uh, 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 forming user clusters. And also uh, non-real time leak uh, according to the uh, ORAN uh, alliance, uh, this take care the uh, takes care of the parameter optimization and the cellular structuring based on the use, uh, antenna location information. So uh, uh, this is the whole uh, structure of our proposed uh, reconfigurable user-centric uh, radio access network. So uh, sometimes uh, some antennas may be uh, switched off uh, because of uh, there are no uh, traffic. Uh, so then, in that case, the antenna uh, uh, distribution may change. But uh, even so, even uh, so, uh, cellular, cellular structure may be adapted to such a, a change in uh, antenna location, in, uh, antenna location, or uh, sorry, antenna distribution. So that's the reason why we call this uh, reconfigurable and uh, user-centric because of uh, uh, user cluster formed based on the user location information. Okay. So then uh, this is the, uh, uh, one of the results uh, by computer simulation. And the uh, users are, and also the antennas are located uh, uh, densely in the center area, uh, like here. And then so the uh, cell size is uh, uh, fixed uh, according to the uh, signal processing capability of uh, base station equipment. So that's the reason why the cell size, uh, uh, area size is uh, uh, small, but the uh, number of antennas is the same. Okay, and then uh, uh, within each cell, uh, you can see here, uh, there are, sorry, it's quite difficult, uh, uh, user clusters are formed. In this case, uh, 16 clusters are formed in each cell. Okay, so, this is a computer simulation. Uh, only the require, uh, required information is a user location and also the antenna location information. Okay, so if the, uh, because of uh, uh, spectrum efficiency, uh, we need to say, uh, use the same frequency band everywhere. Uh, that means the, all the uh, clusters use the same frequency. That, that means the, there are uh, uh, severe uh, interference happens. So we have to take care, or we have to prepare for such a, uh, interference environment, and then to reduce the interfe uh, interference significantly. So we we also the, uh, considering to uh, uh, two types of uh, interference coordination. 
One is the fully decentralized interference coordination. The other one is semi-decentralized interference coordination. In the case of fully decentralized interference coordination, each base station independently, uh, uh, say, you reduce uh, works performs to uh, suppress the uh, intracellular interference and the intercellular interference. And the uh, semi-decentralized uh, interference coordination is the each base station near real-time leak uh, take care of the intracellular interference coordination. And uh, non-real-time leak here uh, take care of the intercellular interference coordination. Again, the Orang uh, Alliance uh, radio access network intelligent controller architecture can be applied to take care of the interference coordination in our uh, system. Okay, so uh, I already said uh, about this, and also the uh, this uh, leak uh, is uh, uh, say uh, working together by mobile edge compute computing to provide the uh, new mobile communication services uh, like uh, semantic communications and also the integrated sensing and communication, ISAC. Such kind of new uh, communication services will be uh, provided by the uh, uh, cross con uh, inter uh, cooperation of user-centric radio access network and uh, uh, mobile edge computing through uh, radio access network intelligent controller, RIC. Okay. So, so we have been working on this type of uh, reconfigurable uh, user-centric radio access network to support the uh, uh, new uh, uh, promising uh, new uh, communication services in a 6G communications uh, system. And also the, uh, we try to improve the spectrum efficiency because of even though the millimeter wave is used uh, Still, bandwidth is not available. Bandwidth is not enough. So, uh, this concludes my talk, and uh, I I hope uh, we can uh, co uh, contribute in the future uh, 6G communications uh, from also the perspective of uh, physical layer uh, technology. Uh, so that we have uh, more, more uh, I, I think uh, five years. Uh, so in uh, close to the. 2030, uh, new uh, communication services, uh, 6G, uh, will appear. And then uh, a technology will be uh, proposed. Many uh, technologies will, will be proposed. So in that, uh, even though uh, our proposed architecture of uh, user, uh, reconfigurable user-centric radio access network can uh, be uh, contributing to uh, improve the uh, 6G communication systems compares to 5G. Okay, this concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Professor Dutch. Please give your gift, big hand. Okay, second invite speaker is the Professor Jun Zhang from HKUST in Hong Kong. Let's give him a big hand. Okay, uh, so first, thanks to the organizers for inviting me here. Um, so I have learned a lot during the uh, past two days' discussion. Um, so there have been a lot of uh, uh, discussions about just say um, how to define semantic communication and application scenarios, right? So lots of uh, related questions and interests. Uh, so here I will uh, present uh, uh, my perspective, a, a bit uh, specific. Uh, uh, so first, I come from Hong Kong, right? So uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Uh, so uh, the title is uh, Task-Oriented Communication for Edge AI. Uh, so I will focus on particular case, right? So application case, Edge AI applications. Okay, so uh, yeah, so uh, let me actually uh, first uh, introduce some uh, research activities uh, on 6G in Hong Kong, right? Uh, so first, uh, uh, as you can see uh, from the figure, right, so uh, the wireless networks, right, so keeps evolving. Uh, so previously, uh, we used the serial network to connect uh, human to human, right, and then um, Internet of Things, 
right? And now uh, we need to consider, right, so with uh, the rising AI applications, right, so we need to consider the next stage, right, so we want to connect intelligence. Um, so in uh, Hong Kong, right, so we have uh, some uh, 6G uh, project, uh, actually is mainly uh, coordinated by our university, and uh, we also have uh, lots of activities related to 6G, right? So for example, uh, this September, we have uh, the first uh, IEEE Hong Kong 6G wireless summit. Uh, so hopefully, right, so we, we will try to make this uh, as an annual event, right? So hopefully in the near future, uh, you will also have the chance to uh, uh, come to uh, join the summit. Okay, so as I mentioned, right, so uh, my main interest is about uh, edge AI. Uh, that is, uh, we want to deploy AI applications at the wireless network edge. Right? So if you think about uh, the emerging AI applications, right, so many of them will be deployed on, say, your mobile devices or maybe even <coughs> IoT devices. Right? But the problem is uh, if you want to um, deploy edge AI systems, right, so first, right, so you need uh, to consider the challenge for the enorm enormous model size. Right? So if you want to have high... Uh, performance, right? So you need these uh, large models. Right? Another is about energy, right? Uh, so because these are mobile devices, right? So energy will be a big concern, right? So how can we overcome the limited uh, energy supply for these devices? Okay, so uh, then the solution is uh, Edge AI, right? So Edge AI's idea basically is that we want to leverage uh, these edge computing systems, right? So people have been talking about uh, edge computing for almost 10 years. So there are some applications, uh, but I don't think, say, edge computing uh, has uh, really taken off. Right? So AI applications actually will be uh, the opportunity for edge computing systems. Right? So here uh, shows some uh, uh, interesting applications uh, enabled by um, edge computing. Uh, so here is actually the, the rationale for uh, edge AI. Right? So uh, if you consider a single edge device, right? So a single device will be limited in its uh, resources, right? So computation, communication, energy resources, right? So even sensing resources, right? So you have uh, each device has limited uh, sensing capability. Right? So now the idea is that we want to uh, introduce or uh, develop uh, effective communication mechanisms to let the devices to uh, easily access external computing resources and exchange information between each other. So that uh, now comes to the task-oriented communication. Right? So let's actually compare these uh, two different figures. Right? So the left one, I call this as data-oriented communication, uh, basically uh, what we are, we are doing now. Right? So nowadays, right, so if you wanted to uh, say ask the edge server to uh, perform some uh, AI inference, then uh, it happens like this. Right? So let's take image classification as an example. Uh, so device, you get uh, data coming in as an image, and then uh, you need to uh, send the image, go through, uh, through the digital communication system, right? So all these components in traditional digital, digital communication system, say 4G, 5G. Right? And then the receiver side, which is a server, right? So it receives the, uh, the data, reconstructs the image, and then apply a neural network uh, to predict the label. But now, for task-oriented communication, right? So now, remember, right? So we, are, we, we care about these AI applications. But for these AI applications, the task is, uh, say, um, classification, detection, segmentation, right? So we care about uh, kind of semantic information about this uh, data. Right? So we do not need to fully reconstruct the data as a receiver side. So what we can do, still take image uh, classification as an example. Uh, so we have a data coming in. So now, uh, instead of going through the digital communication system, right, so we can apply feature extract and then feature encoder so to extract essential information, right, so that is needed for the task. And uh, we can reduce communication cost by the feature encoder. And then we can, reduce, we can send the uh, compressed feature to the server side. So the server will decode the feature and then apply a classification. So then it can directly output the data doc in this case. Right? So you see, uh, because here we only care about the task, right? so this gives us an uh, opportunity to reduce the communication overhead. And uh, in order to implement these uh, uh, key modules, right, so traditional uh, communication system, actually it's difficult for us to uh, carry out this kind of task. So we will use neural networks uh, to, for all these uh, uh, major components. Um, okay, so maybe some of you have been convinced uh, that uh, this is something that uh, we, we need to care about. Right? 
if not, right, so let me give you some uh, more uh, reasons. Uh, this actually is uh, uh, some answer I uh, provided during uh, the, uh, the panel discussion yesterday. So why do we need a task oriented communication? So first reason is uh, actually you may not always need this type of uh, new technique. Right? So if, uh, say, the data amount is uh, relatively small, say, kilobytes, megabytes, right? so you may not need this. Right? But uh, if you consider emerging applications, right? so say a robot self-driving cars, right? so we have richer and richer sensors. So these sensors will generate uh, more and more data. Right? So this means that uh, right? so it will not be easily handled by 4G or 5G networks. Second, um, actually, we do not need to transmit or store everything. Right? Uh, so nowadays, right, so uh, if you still think about the sensing data, right, so sensing data uh, may only ever be seen by algorithms and machines. Right? So actually, as humans, we may not uh, see these uh, data. Right? So we will see just the outcome of the app. Right? So this means that uh, if you can focus on the particular task, right, so you can reduce the, the communication cost. Uh, the third reason is, uh, so for edge AI, uh, the traffic actually is mainly is uplink, right? So devices need to transmit the data to the edge server. Uh, typically, they are sitting maybe access, access points or base station. But if you look at the today's uh, network, right, it has been the case, right? So uh, uplink and downlink capacity is not uh, symmetric, right? So we have a much more capacity in downlink than uplink. But if you look at the traffic, right? So traffic increased dramatically for the uplink. So this becomes a conflict factor, right? So now uh, we need to use limited uplink capacity to support the enormous uplink traffic, right? So this becomes a bottleneck, right? So then uh, we actually can, uh, if we can have a more effective communication mechanism, then we can resolve this issue. Okay, so uh, here's a design goal of task-oriented communication, right? So we want to transmit concise an informative, informative feature with low complexity encoder for low latency, high accuracy inference, right? So that's the key. And there are uh, some design challenges, right? So say uh, unknown distribution, right? So intractable uh, distortion metric and uh, computational complexity. Right? Uh, so this slide actually is uh, the technical part for uh, my talk uh, uh, two days ago. Uh, so I will not go into details, right? So just to give you some idea. Right? So uh, uh, we actually uh, developed some design uh, principles, basic de design principle based on information bottleneck to uh, develop um, task-oriented communication system. And then uh, we have some case studies, right? So for example, uh, edge video analytics, edge assisted localization, and a third one is uh, some, uh, some interesting uh, recent attempts, that is uh, we use large language models to develop an autonomous edge AI system. If you are interested uh, in uh, this part, right, so uh, actually the, uh, the papers are av available on my uh, webpage, right, so if you are interested, you can uh, check the papers on my webpage. And uh, that's uh, the end of my talk, thanks. Thank you, Professor Jun. <laughs> okay. Uh, next speaker is the Medi Professor Mehdi Benis from Oldu University in Finland. Let's give him a big hand. All right. All right. So first of all, again, very happy to be here. Thanks a lot for this great workshop. I think these have been uh, two fantastic uh, days in Pyeongchang. And uh, so what I'm going to be doing is uh, giving you a very high level a compressed representation of this very rich and wide topic uh, called semantic uh, communication for 6G. So how I like to always frame this is to first talk about what 6G, because some people uh, may, may, uh, may understand 6G in a different uh, way. So for me, in fact, um, just, uh, oh yeah, Oof. pointer is frozen. All right, okay. So in fact, so 6G promised uh, to be, of course, a revolutionary technology, technology right, with respect to, to, to 5G. So it promised to, of course, connect the digital, physical, biological worlds. But the current visions that we see around the world, and I, of course, I come from University of Oulu, which had the first uh, world 6G program. Uh, so taking maybe, you know, just uh, scaling up in terms of uh, bits per second, per hertz, more bandwidth, more base stations, which are actually not sustainable solutions. Uh, taking some requirements of, of 5G, for example, in terms of packet error rates, 
sorry, <laughs> is also uh, uh, not, not a very convincing uh, uh, requirement, especially that uh, we need to look at co-designing, not only focusing on the packet error rate, but of course, if you have a control application, you need to look at other uh, uh, requirements, stability, for example, uh, and other, other, other KPIs, right? And of course, just uh, uh, taking AI and saying that I'm adding AI uh, in 5G and calling it 6G is also questionable because AI is a vast topic. What we do know today is AI is brittle, energy hungry, doesn't generalize, and so on and so forth. So these are just a few, uh, few numbers we can say if you take, I mean, 5G requirements and try to, okay, and, and just try to multiply by five to get uh, peak data rates. Same for latency, reliability, you can see here. Take five nines reliability in 5G, and go for nine, nine reliability, uh, nine nines, let's say. Uh, not very convincing, at least for, as, far as, I, as far as I'm concerned. Resiliency also, which could be actually the new KPI, which we didn't have in, uh, in 5G or, or even previous generations, is actually ill-defined. For many people, it's, it's synonymous with reli reliability and robustness. Actually, it's a completely different uh, concept. In short, today, 6G is at least uh, my, uh, my view is a uh, completely incremental evolution of, of, of 5G. So this is a little bit where actually semantic communication comes because now what we want to do, instead of you know, embarking on this deeper, faster uh, uh, bandwagon, we want to flip this, this kind of trend by asking two questions. So the first one is essentially, can we actually transmit less, not more, right? Uh, and relax some of these stringent requirements. Uh, question number two is, 6G promised actually to be the first generation for communication for machines. Okay, good. So in that case, if it's going to be about human-machine uh, collaboration, therefore, or one good way is to actually get inspired from humans' mode of cognition. And it turns out there's this famous System 1, System 2 uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, taxonomy, which was proposed by this Nobel Prize winner, so uh, uh, Daniel Kahneman, and then later on uh, adopted by the AI community. So they have the system one, system two. System one is the, the fast and conscious pattern matching, or just call it learn statistical patterns from data. And that's actually exactly the 99% of all works in semantic communication today, arguably, right? What's missing, in fact, is the system two, which is the one that you have in your brain and mind, which allows us to plan, reason, handle exceptions, generalize outside of distribution, okay? So, I'm oh, sorry, there's an animation there. Uh, all right, so, so anyway, so, so now, of course, semantic communication is related to this uh, Paul Shannon communication, right? So everybody is familiar with this uh, Shannon paper, level A, level B, level C, level, uh, on the, on the left-hand side. So in fact, all the requirements of 6G today are based on, on, on level A, and that's why they make sense from that perspective, right? So of course, the idea is, you know, uh, transmit X, encode it, add redundancy, maybe leverage MIMO, and then get X hat, make sure X equals X hat. At that time, Shannon was not interested in, in structure or meaning or memory, removed all of it, right? And then of course, we, I mean, that's what we have been using uh, all along. The notion of, notion of information also is very, uh, 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 let's say, limited in the case of Shannon, it's just related to you know, statistical uh, description of information. That's not the information that you use to, to talk to people. That's not the information that robots will be using to navigate. That's not the information Tesla cars one day will be communicating. So there is this level B, level C, in fact, uh, you know, which is about really, uh, as, as, as June said, in fact, we want to communicate now the meaning from point A to point B, and then the receiver wants to act on that meaning to solve, to solve a task, right? So the way I like to look at it, in fact, is really to bring back structure, bring back the notion of abstraction, memory, and so on. And now, of course, what is level B, level C? I mean, it means different things to different people. For me, I'm trying to look at it from a more maybe mathematical perspective. So what's level B for me? What's meaning? Meaning is going to be, in fact, related to this notion of le learning concepts from data, right? Learning, try to learn maybe equivalence classes of certain you know, types, for example, and that's gonna be essentially what I call meaning, not just a label of a cat of a dog. I'm trying to understand what actually even a cat means, right? So you need to understand maybe its attributes, what makes a cat a cat in some sense, right? And then of course you can look at uh, uh, point number two there, which is actually about generative model, because, because in fact, the way we communicate, at least I think, is in fact we are, we are actually, by understanding the, the speaker, we are actually generating internally, with our internal model, what we are receiving from the other person, or maybe if it's an image, if an environment. So we have this diffusion model type of thing which is happening internally, right? And then you do all sorts of tasks, maybe reasoning, uh, inference, 
uh, deductive logic and so on. So what, what I want you to pay attention to is actually the notion of information here goes beyond channel. In short, in fact, we talk about information not as a scalar, right, as in the channel case, but as uh, 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 we talk about information spaces, information structures, and categories. And I think this is actually where, where I think the kind of the, the breakthrough may, 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 be, may, 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 uh, may arise. And of course, this is a generalization of channel. So we are not getting rid of channel. It's just we are enlarging the notion of information. All right? So, all right. And of course, now on the AI front, I think you all know this. We know that, I mean, uh, current AI are, are, are models are limited. So many reasons, right? So of course, there is the energy part. They don't generalize well. There are just statistical patterns. I mean, federated learning, which is one of the most popular techniques, right, is still just uh, about learning, you know, uh, kind of statistics from, from data. What's missing is very clear. I'm not going to repeat it again, right? So in fact, what we tried to do a few years ago is to kind of maybe enrich what we call a model, right? So uh, of course, it's, maybe, maybe these are six. There could be more uh, kind of desiderata. One is uh, model has to be a function of the data. Uh, compressed kind of uh, 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 model, but still sufficient to solve a task. But then you have these other uh, ones, invariance, disentanglement, causal, uh, causal, causality, and emergence, which are actually not really present in current models. Of course, the area goes very fast, so you will see these already now. So invariance is a very important notion, in fact. Invariance to, for example, translation, rotation, deformation, right? These are extremely important because that's, that is actually the structure. Okay, so maybe you can look at it through this lens. Disentanglement is exactly when I look at this scene, I'm able to, design, to break it down in terms of people, relationship with the, with the, with the, with the coffee mug. You know, so there's more than just look, looking at it in terms of pixels. Right? Causality, you no know, need to, to convince you about the importance and emergence because in fact these, these, these models are not hard coded. They emerge via interaction. You interact with your, with your environment, you actually collect your data, you sense it, and then you train a model. This is different than supervised kind of learning, right? And with that, you can now try to learn different type of models to solve a task. X could be, uh, I don't know, uh, training, inference, reasoning, right? So, and now we come a bit to this, uh, something we, 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 we do realize. In fact, the, the notion of semantic communication is a little bit, uh, I mean, ill-defined, or maybe it means different things to different people. So we decided somehow to adopt this system one, system two approach from AI folks in communication to at least unify. Don't say this is not semantic communication. Say it is, but it's system one, OK? And maybe system two is a bit. Uh, uh, uh. So what uh, system one semantic communication, in fact, is all about learning in the data space. For example, you have this, 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 this person here interacting with two, two uh, let's say, service, service types, EMBB, you are the C, right? So maybe in terms of personal uh, compression, he just wants to focus on one part of the screen. Right? So you're just operating in data space. Maybe you ignore all the other uh, uh, field of view. For some people, this is uh, semantic communication. Maybe, maybe I don't know. But I would, I would put it under system one. The, uh, surprisingly or interestingly, the one here, which is the, the kind of related to open AI uh, kind of uh, use cases. We have a, a picture of a dog, right? And you, 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 you map it. You transform it in terms of to text. You send the text over wireless. And then the receiver generates a different dog. So some people call this semantic communication. Well, it's a very simple one, right? So here you can look at it from different perspective again, uh, either through the, 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 the ingredients or through the task, which is still just reconstruction. The receiver does not really understand what a, what a dog means, right? Also for some folks, uh, AOI, so age of information, the freshness of a data packet is semantic information. Well, actually, it's a very, again, narrow Definition, all right? I'm not saying it is not, but it's a very narrow definition. Could be because the, the I in AOI is still a Shannon information type. Okay? Now, if you give me maybe the, the, the kind of topological uh, 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 AOI, right, then maybe I'll be more convinced because that's actually more what I'll, I'd like to, to, to push for, right? In short, so here semantics is just the fresher, the better, perceptual compression, image text transformation. Take whatever VAEs, GPT style, uh, apply it to a text, image, uh, extract the feature, send it to the receiver. That's really done today. Okay? Deep joint source channel coding is here. All right. So system two, which is I think the most interesting one, more difficult, will take a few years, is essentially giving so you can look at it from the lens of, of course, is desiderata, but maybe more interestingly in terms of the task. What are we trying to do? Well, I told you system two is all about planning, reasoning imagination, right? 
so with that, you can actually look at, you know, uh, you have the use case there with robots. You, put, you have a robot fleet uh, in a factory. You don't want to use 3GPP language there. You want to emerge a language, a protocol between these robots from their multimodal sensory. What's the vocabulary? What's the language? What's the syntax? Who talks to whom, right? I think it's a very interesting use case. Then, of course, you have the other one. I, I have some more details uh, in the next slide. Uh, Nokia in 2019, I believe, AI native uh, kind of track research emerged. So they said, okay, let me teach uh, uh, 3GPP language uh, from a teacher to UEs who have no idea about the rules of the game. 3GPP is a language, right? So it turns out they managed to do it. I'll tell you the, the, the issue with that. And then other use cases. I don't want to dwell too much on this. I think this is actually the one which will emerge at some point. So without this, there is no semantic communication as far as uh, I'm concerned. But anyways, okay. okay. So I, I mean, just one slide here to really, I mean, uh, summarize a bit. So this idea of system one Mac, right? So as I told you, Nokia basically just uh, tried to throw in AI to allow uh, a base station to teach this language uh, uh, to two users, right? So in fact, they use this, 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 this uh, framework of uh, reinforced inter-agent learning from Jacob Foster, a very popular area, a uh, very popular uh, uh, framework, which just basically taking, um, taking a model-free uh, RL framework and adding communication, right? And you have to train end-to-end. -end. That's what you see in the middle. Uh, and then what they do, in fact, they learn this policy, which is this uh, policy pie, which goes from the state space to the action space completely black box, uh, 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 model-free approach. The problem with this type of approaches, these are kind of system one, because you should never learn in the data space. As I told you, you should learn in this information space, which is maybe the one where you have this topological uh, notion of invariance, and that will give you automatically more robustness, allows you to generalize better than just, you know, taking the state space without actually imbuing the structure. So that's actually what we did, which you see here, so, uh, yeah, the, on the left, the bottom left, right, we call this system 2 Mac kind of. Uh, so here we learn this policy in the information space. So now, information space here is related to the notion of abstraction, which is also a loaded word. But uh, so here what we did is state abstraction. We tried to compress this uh, state in terms of, you know, most important states if you want. So you can do it in terms of cardinality, in terms of features, or in terms of maybe more, more sophisticated mathematical notions of symmetries or invariance. And we just threw it, compared it with the Nokia approach, and we showed actually, well actually it's a bit hidden there, we showed that actually that MAPO uh, with, uh, with abstraction outperformed the Nokia baseline, which actually did not generalize. Okay, the issue of machine learning, remember, is just you cannot generalize. So here, by using this idea of abstraction in the state space, you are actually able to, to do so, right? This is an EMBB use case. And then we had also this joint work with Yonsei. We tried to go beyond these neural protocol models, which are just statistical models, toward more uh, symbolic protocols, because I think these are more interesting, it allows you to, to manipulate, maybe do some algebra, on your protocol, maybe you wanna, you don't wanna retrain, that's the thing, right? You wanna basically just run a few, a few scenarios, right, uh, before maybe trying to deploy them in the, in, in the real world. So I think uh, for sake of time, I'm not gonna dwell too much on this, I just have some remarks in closing. So, so I, do, I do believe semantic communication will provide the leap, there's no doubt about that, not only for communication, but even for AI. The trend now is even the AI folks are converging toward distributed AI, it's clear, in LLMs, it's clear in robotics, it's clear in so many ways. Only problem is they do abstract communication, which maybe at some point they will be convinced. Anyways, there's a huge difference between system one, system two, semantic communication. I hope you're convinced. Deep joint source channel coding in system one is happening today, uh, I think. Then without semantic communication, there will be no human-robot collaboration and so on and so forth. I think it's clear. Even this distributed metaverse, which could be one use case, will not happen, I believe. Interoperability also is, is a loaded word, but it's related to this topic of semantic communication, how different systems with different language, different specifications are able to communicate, okay? Without hard-coding those rules. Today, the rules are hard-coded. We don't want to hard-code anymore. And just for the ones who are more curious, in fact, I mean, there is a lot of mathematical foundations in these topics, in this topic of semantic communication, which is wor worth exploring, uh, 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 which again goes beyond statistics, right? More towards algebraic topology and other other uh, 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 tools. But in short, really, the bottom line here, the kind of the 
to close is really we just need to, 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 to look at ourselves. How do we plan, reason, how do we learn by interaction, how we are multimodal, how we are curious agents, right? And I think that's actually the right recipe for, 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 for semantic communication. And thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mehdi. Okay, next turn is the Professor Danilo Cominello from Sapienza University of Rome from Italy. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Danilo Cominello. I'm from Sapienza University of Rome. And uh, uh, my expertise is uh, actually on uh, uh, developing an uh, algorithm of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning for signal processing. And very recently, we um, started working on semantic communications, also due to a national uh, Italian program. And uh, um, we believe that uh, this kind of uh, uh, field may require a lot of uh, uh, AI, so it is a perfect field in, in order to have the, the, a good integration of AI models uh, for a very uh, new and vibrant um, um, uh, scenarios and uh, uh, scenarios in communication. So uh, I enjoyed a lot uh, being here and uh, participating in this workshop. Uh, and thanks again, the organizer, for uh, uh, inviting me because uh, it, uh, it, it is very inspiring for me to be here. Uh, in this kind of uh, uh, work, I would like to show some examples of how to integrate AI in uh, semantic communication. And in particular, uh, we focus on a specific uh, uh, our application like uh, audio semantic uh, communication and specifically but uh, it is focused on audio but it can be extended also to other kind of uh, media and uh, uh, we focus on generative AI in order to show how to uh, integrate this kind of uh, new emerging uh, uh, AI technologies. So uh, we were always interested in uh, developing audio communication systems and so uh, how to send the audio information from uh, the sender to the receiver uh, and try to um, um, try to keep not only uh, the the each word, each kind of information you are uh, sending, but also the perception of the things you are uh, uh, in the things you are sending to the receiver. So uh, actually, we um, can uh, uh, just. Uh, figure out a scheme, a, a kind of scheme for the uh, audio information, for the audio transmission from the sender to a receiver. So basically we have a, a forward problem, a forward path in which we want to send some kind of information. We have some uh, blocks of, of course, of signal analysis uh, and pre-processing like uh, transforming uh, in a different representation in frequency domain and so on. We encode our information we send to the uh, into a communication channel, and then on the other end, we receive the information which may be corrupted, uh, uh, noised, uh, and uh, uh, we may suffer from uh, any kind of interference and so on. So we need to decode the information, and uh, very often we need some kind of uh, signal reconstruction and uh, also enhancement because uh, this is due to the fact that this kind of process. Uh, definitely introduce some kind of uh, uh, also distortions and we may have some loss of uh, uh, bits and so on, information and so on. So uh, this kind of, uh, uh, we, we focus uh, actually on this part, on the, uh, on the last part of the, of this process uh, in which we are interested in uh, in this kind of inverse problem. So we want to solve the inverse problem because actually we want to recover the original information. So basically we started from some kind of information. Our information re at, at the receiver side is uh, uh, corrupted and we want to recover. So we want to invert the problem. So how to do this kind of, how to solve this kind of problems? 
So basically, uh, okay, so we can have uh, a lot of application uh, that falls inside the, this kind of category. So for instance, we may experience some kind of uh, 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 noise, uh, noise uh, corruption of the, of the information. So we may be interested in denoising uh, our audio information, but also we may lose some kind of uh, information and we may be interested in uh, uh, recovering uh, the missing parts or having some kind of in painting. Or uh, we may be also, uh, we may have uh, some problem in uh, reducing the bandwidth uh, and we want to recover the original bandwidth, but we can also try to uh, enrich the, the bandwidth uh, and so we can have some kind of super resolution of uh, our audio at the uh, another application is of course the uh, compressed sense we want to decompress uh, some kind of information so how to uh, take all these kind of pro uh, problems uh, uh, so traditional solutions for audio communication uh, involving uh, machine learning uh, of course uh, uh, try to uh, apply some kind of algorithms, uh, uh, at the, uh, of course, uh, uh, at the receiver side, but of course, uh, uh, considering the end-to-end -end learning, uh, because we want to recover the original information from the sender, so we want to uh, try to compare the, uh, the, the, set, the information that has been sent to the information that is uh, uh, received and also reconstructed, reconstructed or uh, enhanced. Uh, now we uh, don't want to uh, change, of course, this uh, paradigm, but we want to extend. I think that semantic uh, communication uh, may give us the possibility to extend and give uh, uh, beyond this kind of uh, traditional paradigm. And so uh, one of the things we can do is try to introduce some kind of generative AI solution. So actually, we removed uh, the link from the sender. Sorry. Uh, OK, we removed the link from the sender. And we actually work on, uh, on the received information. So we want actually to um, work on the distribution of the data and uh, in an unsupervised manner. So we don't ask something uh, uh, related to the original uh, uh, recovery of the, of the bit transmitted. But we are interested in the semantic. So we are interested in uh, what is the meaning uh, we, are want to, we are interested at the receiver side. And so this is something that can be a uh, uh, matter for uh, generative AI. So uh, one example of audio semantic communication uh, is uh, this kind of models that we uh, propose. Basically, we have uh, something on the, um, the sender side. We have some audio file, and uh, uh, we want to extract the semantic. OK, what is the semantic for uh, an audio file? So, uh, audio can be in a general sense, or we can uh, talk about uh, a general audio, but also speech, of course. So, uh, for instance, we can use large language models in order to extract some text for the from the from the audio. And now it is very; uh, they are very uh, uh, they are very easy to be integrated in uh, some kind of application. So it is easy to extract some text from audio, and we can send. Uh, Instead of sending just uh, an encoding of the signals, we can send some kind of uh, embedding of the, of the audio together with some textual semantic, uh, so some kind of information related to the meaning of, uh, of the text. Uh, on the other side, uh, of course, we can have uh, some kind of information that is corrupted uh, and uh, uh, include some kind of noise distortion and so on. So we want to inverse the problem by using some kind of diffusion process or generative AI in general. And uh, uh, starting from some noisy semantic and corrupted embedding, we want to recover some kind of uh, uh, information uh, which is uh, not exactly the, um, uh, the, the original uh, information in terms of uh, uh, bit information, but we want to recover the uh, semantics of the, of, the send, the, um, of the information we sent. 
So for instance, here are, there are some kind of uh, examples uh, for uh, denoising and in painting. Uh, so for, for, for example, we can transmit some kind of audio and uh, we may have some kind of uh, addition of noise, which is the most simple case. Uh, or, and we can restore the audio signal by using generative AI. So without any uh, aid from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the sender side, or we may want to fill uh, the gap where we have some missing information. And so here are some examples. For instance, uh, in, the, in these examples, uh, we have... Uh, oh, we could watch a movie. That would be lots of fun. Don't you think so? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Come on, let's go. This is just an information of an audio transmitted together with a, a prompt. The prompt is just something that is extracted from this audio and it is a, just a common sense. So it is just an explanation of what is happening. So it is not the translation of the words, but it is just the explanation of what is happening in that moment. But this information is uh, corrupted. Okay, so at the receiver signal, we can uh, achieve this kind of uh, uh, information. Usually, using some kind of uh, generative AI, we may restore the the sense, the what is uh, transmitted, uh, just by using both the. Uh, a compression of the, an embedding of the audio, but together with some kind of semantics. Uh, and so we have some restored information. We could watch a movie. That'd be lots of fun. Don't you think so? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Come on, let's go. In, uh, on, uh, the, on this website, you can find a lot of examples uh, with different kind of uh, uh, channels, conditions, and so on. We have also some kind of quantitative results uh, for the noising compared to other methods, of course. Um, and uh, this is another example uh, involving some kind of in painting, uh, meaning that we have uh, some kind of uh, situation in which some audio, some audio information is completely missing during the transmission. So we may experience at the receiver side something, some program like this one. How to recover this information? It is not just a matter of uh, interpolation or uh, uh, something like this, but we want to generate some information that uh, just by considering the information that we know from the style of the audio and the something which is also transmitted in the semantic. Okay, so based on these two information, uh, we can restore some kind of original uh, uh, audio signal. So I choose this kind of application because uh, in audio signal processes it's very difficult to restore some kind of audio without uh, listening to some kind of musical noise or any kind of distortion. So this kind of operation is very, very uh, complex uh, considering the audio signals. And so uh, also for this case we have some uh, quantitative results and we show that we can uh, also increase the state of the art uh, for tra with traditional uh, machine learning performance. So how to evaluate performance also with uh, this kind of models in AI? We may also evaluate performance in the semantic space because we don't have any kind of information from the sender. So we need to understand how to uh, evaluate the quality of the restored audio. So uh, in, this uh, in this kind of examples, uh, the semantic space Space is the, the textual semantics. So we try to use the same uh, approach and uh, 
extract the text from using just some kind of a large language, language model. So extract the text from the original and extract the text from the uh, received one and try to compare so with the same textual information. And also uh, in this kind, so it is just our evaluation, but we compared with a lot of examples and uh, we improved a lot uh, the performance also uh, considering this kind of evaluation. Uh, so why using uh, uh, generative AI for uh, audio semantic communication? Because we have high expressiveness. So it is not a matter of just uh, filling the gap, but we want to have some kind of information which is what we want to perceive. Uh, we can also having some kind of separate uh, models on receiver and transmitter. Uh, we may also improve uh, these models by uh, tackling and addressing some kind of slow sampling and uh, uh, also addressing some um, computational requirements from these models. But one of the things I believe it is very important from this kind of uh, AI models is the fact that we, on, one, on one side we can uh, 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 improve traditional audio tasks um, like denoising, uh, restoration in painting and so on, super resolution and etc. On the other hand, we may have the possibility to extend and go beyond the traditional uh, uh, tasks. So we may be interested in the future of having audio editing, modality translation, meaning that I don't want to, I want to send an email, uh, an audio, but at the receiver side, I may want also to recover, I don't know, some kind of text or some kind of uh, image representing the, uh, the signal. Or me, um, we may want to change the domain. So uh, like uh, the simple case is, uh, I don't know, changing the domain uh, for, from the change of text. But it is not a matter of uh, just uh, translating in another language. We may want to also uh, change the environment. OK, so it is uh, uh, completely uh, something which can be completely new. And also, we may want also some kind of semantic aware sonorization, meaning like some video or uh, adding music, adding uh, uh, speech to some uh, uh, other uh, mo um, modality. And also some kind of having some kind of audio foundation models. So in the future, we can uh, uh, definitely also improve this kind of methods, reducing inference computation, uh, uh, testing a lot of uh, real scenarios, uh, dealing with uh, energy allocations, uh, and also exploring uh, uh, emerging application for semantic communication. Uh, these are just some references I used for this talk. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Danilo. OK. Next time is the Professor Eleonora Grassucci from the Sarpeja University of Rome. Let's give her a big hand. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank once again the organizers for giving me the opportunity uh, to spend uh, uh, two very inspiring days uh, and discussing uh, uh, with many interesting uh, people. So uh, I have a background in data science and deep learning. So uh, let's say artificial intelligence. And uh, I recently jumped into uh, the the topic of semantic communication, since uh, I strongly believe, uh, as we have seen also from the previous talk, that uh, uh, generative models, deep generative models, uh, can significantly enhance uh, some aspects uh, of semantic communication. So first of all, uh, why we are talking about uh, uh, this topic? Since uh, the volume of multimedia data has incredibly grown in the very uh, recent time, and also the quality of such data has increased. So for example, we have better microphones, we have uh, better cameras, we have uh, uh, lots of sensors. Uh, for example, uh, autonomous cars uh, are uh, running over the streets of San Francisco, and uh, uh, delivery uh, with drones uh, is uh, uh, arriving next year in Italy and I guess uh, all of you in this room uh, uh, 
is used to uh, do and uh, make uh, lots of video calls during uh, uh, your working day. So uh, it's here and we have to face uh, with the problem of communicating and transmitting such a huge high volume of high quality data. So together with semantic communication, we can uh, um, leverage machine and deep learning and artificial intelligence to deal with a large volume of data. However, uh, sometimes uh, classical machine and deep learning techniques uh, may experience some issues in shaping and modeling very high quality data, such as uh, 4K videos or uh, uh, several sensors. So, this is a we may need something else. We may need uh, generative AI that uh, have shown to excel in shaping high quality multimedia data and multimodal since we are dealing with text and images together or video that has the sounds and has the uh, silent part, the images part. Uh, this is a... Um, a figure that represents uh, some of the issues uh, when uh, dealing with uh, machine or deep learning uh, uh, models uh, uh, in semantic communications. So, uh, as far as I experienced, uh, uh, the problem of complex data is surely uh, a big issue that we have to uh, face. Uh, similarly, the semantics extraction uh, from such data uh, is not as straightforward. Uh, again, uh, we may uh, face the problem uh, of uh, robustness to channel corruption, interferences, and something like that. For sure, uh, then, uh, once the semantics uh, is received at, at the receiver side, uh, uh, the challenge of exploiting such information is still an open issue for several applications. And then, for sure, we have to uh, manage uh, the resources uh, to build the sustainable frameworks. So we know that uh, uh, generative models uh, are uh, uh, extremely good at uh, um, manipulating uh, high quality data. So in this case, for example, we may generate uh, a video starting from uh, a static image uh, under the guidance of some text and there are many examples like that uh, with the videos or audios as you uh, have seen before and images and so on. But what about communication? I think that uh, we may build uh, generative semantic communication frameworks uh, more or less, for example, like that. So suppose we have uh, an original image here. <laughs> And we want to extract the semantics uh, from this image, uh, and the semantics uh, may be uh, very uh, different, may assume very different representations, since uh, uh, depending on the task and uh, on the data, we may uh, want uh, different uh, uh, semantics representations. So maybe we can have uh, the, uh, the semantic map representing uh, objects and their significance, but maybe we prefer to have uh, a text, a caption on what uh, is in the image, or uh, some bounding boxes uh, to represent uh, the objects in such uh, images, depending on the task we want to uh, solve. Then the, this information is passed through the communication channel and uh, uh, they may uh, be corrupted by the channel and we have to deal with this. But let's go at the receiver since uh, uh, what is of our interest is the generative model that we have over there and every generative model uh, basically starts uh, from a very simple distribution from which uh, it is easy to sample. In this case, it's a noise distribution, a Gaussian distribution. And uh, starting from this distribution, this noise sample, let's say, we can shape this noise sample with the generative model under the guidance of the semantics. So we leave and we drive the uh, generation under the semantic guidance. So we lead the generative model to generate uh, what we want to generate. 
in this case, uh, new images that uh, are possibly infinite, since we can generate infinite images, uh, that always preserve the same semantic information. And this is a very powerful uh, uh, tool in several applications. So let's see an example. In this case, for example, uh, uh, we have a sender that extracts the semantic map from uh, the, the car running over the streets, and then send these maps over the channel to regenerate a new map with, uh, from very sorry, <laughs> from uh, very uh, noisy and compressed inf semantic information. The first thing uh, I want to mention about this uh, uh, work is that uh, uh, this model is not trained end-to-end. -end. So we don't need to train uh, the, the sender and the receiver end-to-end. -end. We can have any segmentation model on the sender, and then we can have a generative model on the receiver trained separately. The second thing, thing I want to mention is that, uh, again, uh, here uh, we start from a noise and uh, we shape uh, through a, diffu a semantic diffusion model um, a new generated images that preserves uh, the semantic uh, of the original image. So we don't care about, for example, in this case, uh, uh, the color of the car. We just care about the fact that there is a car uh, uh, on the street uh, and there are buildings uh, on uh, uh, their part. So let's see some results. Uh, for example, here we have uh, a semantic map uh, that we want to transmit, uh, and these are the generated images uh, under different uh, channel conditions. You see here uh, we have uh, very highly degraded channel conditions, and uh, as you can see from this image, the generated images uh, are still of high quality even though the received information is very, very highly corrupted, and moreover, Consider that, for example, we want to accomplish the task of recognizing objects in the streets. And let's see that even when the, uh, the received information is very corrupted, we still can recognize objects, uh, pedestrians and cars and their positions under the streets. And moreover, if we want to estimate the depth and the distance of this object from the uh, observer, the, let's say, the, our car, uh, we still can recognize and estimate the depth of objects, uh, so potentially uh, letting uh, the car uh, autonomous, uh, autonomously driving since it can, it can recognize objects and their positions and their uh, distance. So, Let's wrap up uh, the talk. So we should use uh, and start using generative models uh, for semantic communications in specific application, uh, basically because uh, generative models and generative AI is one of the hottest topic in uh, AI research. So it will be developed a lot in the next few months and few years. Uh, because uh, it shows uh, the uh, incredibly ability of uh, shaping uh, real world uh, and uh, high quality data. And since, uh, I mean, our world is going uh, to produce uh, much more high quality multimedia, multimodal data, generative uh, AI and generative models uh, are uh, excel, uh, excel in uh, shaping and solving this task. Moreover, uh, several ac application of generative models exist uh, and they can be therefore flexible to be employed in several application or domain of application. And finally, for semantic communication, uh, we have seen how uh, in this talk and in the previous talk, uh, generative models uh, indeed uh, excel and uh, uh, show superior ability in uh, exploiting, uh, exploiting data semantics. 
Of course, uh, several issues uh, and open problems uh, still exist. Uh, so, for example, uh, generative model use usually um, has a, a high computational demanding, so we need uh, high computational resources, and they consume a lot of energy, and produce massive amount of CO2, and they usually require uh, um, high performance uh, uh, GPUs that are very hard to be embedded on smaller devices. So uh, we can uh, try to address these challenges uh, in the next years. Uh, so by building sustainable models, uh, by reducing the computations of sub such models uh, mm, in uh, several ways, for example, uh, considering strategies that uh, uh, reuse uh, uh, net neural network blocks uh, or uh, prune uh, the blocks uh, and the neurons that are uh, less useful for the task, uh, uh, also, we have to address the challenge of replicability since uh, uh, we may develop uh, models that can be um, used and accessible to, every, to everyone so that everyone can start uh, building uh, generative models for semantic communications and enhance uh, uh, future, future research. And of course, uh, we have to uh, face uh, the challenge of developing uh, faster strategies for, uh, uh, infer for the inference and the sampling of uh, uh, generative uh, models for communication systems. So this is the end, and thanks uh, for the attention. Thank you, Alain. <laughs> OK, next is our last speaker, Professor Jiong Park from Deakin University in Australia. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Jung Park. Uh, as a last speaker, and uh, given the limited time, I just I was just asked to uh, present my talk as quick as possible, and then yeah, that makes me you know try my best to do uh, and, and enable and achieve the goal of semantic communication, delivering only the meaningful information without ignoring all the all the details. I, I'll try my best. So I have two research focuses at hand. One is. Uh, uh, machine learning for communication, and the other is uh, communication for machine learning that includes varied learning and, uh, and other distributed machine learning techniques. And I think that semantic communication is a technology uh, lying at the, at the confluence in between these two uh, emerging and promising areas, machine learning for communication and communication for machine learning. And I, I think that pre, uh, prior speakers have already covered the basic understanding and the structure of the semantic communication, goal of the semantic communication. Uh, from my perspective, my, my concern is more like uh, uh, how to adapt the recent breakthroughs made in the machine learning within the scope of the semantic communication. That is uh, twofold. One is uh, generative AI, such as text to image conversion, and the other one is uh, uh, large language model like ChatGPT. How can we incorporate these two uh, new big elements within the com uh, context of the semantic communication to enable this? Okay, let's treat the, the, the center block is uh, corresponding to the current deep neural network based, deep learning based semantic communication. And then we can add the generative AI blocks, for example, text to image or image text blocks to transform any different raw data such as image into the text domain. And then by utilizing this large language model, using this text message, we can further infer the others, for example, listener's intent, context, and change your text as intended, and then transmit it. And then at the receiver side, by also utilizing this uh, generative AI in the, in the reverse way, you can, if needed, reconstruct the original data or their intentionally manipulated data. And then likewise, at the receiver side, by utilizing a, a large language model, you can also change the text, uh, the, the received text, and then uh, infer the, trans the sender's context and many others. And then to that end, the key point is that text-to-image conversion, as an example, has been studied and considered uh, with, with the long history 
but mostly focusing on compressing the original data size, for example, image to text. But in this case, the key role of these types of uh, generative AI is not only for compressing, simple compression, but instead for transforming any raw data into the, the language domain such that we can utilize the benefits of the reasoning capability of the, these types of large language model or that it is built over and on the, uh, the, the human natural language. And the, the, the reason why we need to utilize these types of language model is that it contains generic knowledge. So you, by the way, only utilizing this type of uh, generative AI, we can change their data modality. We can uh, manipulate uh, uh, their intentions and semantics. But the limitation is that uh, the, those capabilities are limited by their training data. But if the training data size is, is, can cover the entire data over the internet. That is the case of the large language model. So large language model contains the generic knowledge, and then that can be fine-tuned by pro simply providing some demonstration, and then the large language model can understand the context, and then that can be utilized for your intended desired task. And these types of, types of principle can also be applied not only for uh, this data communication, but also for protocol designing, and, but the downside is that large language model uh, require, and generative AI, they are large models, very large models. So in, so in other words, we need to pay the significant cost for computational complexity. So, uh, so now we are uh, concerning how to reduce these types of com uh, additional com computational complexity uh, for uh, coping with our own device requirements and many others. So as an example, uh, by default, we can, uh, in this remote control example, we have enabled the, uh, the, uh, the operations by only utilizing large language models. It doesn't require any, any, any training that is costly in terms of time, but it can be immediately uh, achieved. And then, but the, the point is that it's too costly in terms of the computational complexity. Then uh, here, we utilize uh, this capability of uh, uh, guiding the, uh, the capability of uh, this control for guiding the traditional deep neural network based approach by utilizing the so-called knowledge translation technique and then thereby we can achieve the, their, their integrated version of the, 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 the model uh, constructed using the deep neural network. Then uh, we, have, we uh, were able to reduce the computational complexity uh, 1,000 times at the, the user side, and then uh, one, uh, 2 million times at the base station side. In this case, we have considered one base station is controlling two remote users. Okay, that's uh, the very brief summary of my presentation, and I hope uh, it was a uh, semantic communication between us. Thank you. Thank you, Jiong. <laughs> the last. It's a great honor to introduce the Professor Tasik Lee, who is the president of the Korean Foundation Science Technology. He will give us some welcome remark, uh, welcome remark to all of us. Please give him a big hand. Good afternoon. I cannot hear you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm sorry, I apologize for late opening address because we usually our uh, R&D budget is just $30 billion. Uh, this year, uh, they cut the $3 billion. So I went to the uh, Congress and then I met the uh, leader of the uh, ruling parties and then the opposition party. So hopefully I wish I got the $1 billion back. So uh, it will be back. So next year you will come back again. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I will introduce all the experts and uh, you know, my fellows. First of all, he is good. And uh, Dr. Kosumu, he is a domestic organi organizer. Give the big hands. <laughs> and Choi Jin Ho. He is from the uh, Deakin University from Australia. Please stand up. Yeah, please do the hand. 
and uh, Humi Yuki Atachi Sensei, please stand up. Uh, she is a specially appointed research fellow from Japan. Thank you so much for your coming. And Professor Jun Chang, please stand up. He's from the Hong Kong University, so uh, actually from China. <laughs> and uh, Medi Benis uh, from Aulu University, Finland. <laughs> and uh, Professor Danilo Cominello. <laughs> and uh, Park Ji Hong, please stand up. Yep. Then finally, and least the Miss uh, Elon Nora Gaulucci <laughs> from Italy. Uh, distinguished fellow scientists and engineers, I'm the president of a Korean Federation of Science and uh, Technology Societies. Cost uh, we. Uh, F is a silence, we can use the, not cost, uh, we are using the cost. And uh, our member is uh, 607 uh, organization members, 400 is uh, uh, academic societies, and then 207 is uh, including the old government research institute and also uh, companies uh, research institute too. And uh, we called our personal member is 5 million people. That means one tenth is a scientist and engineers. We are trying to get more faster and faster and the good and good result for the science and the technology societies. And we have a local government is a certain regional uh, organization and also uh, 19 uh, overseas branches in, uh, including the Italy and then Europe and then Canada, America and then Asia. Uh, this uh, uh, 2023 BrainLink XLAB Day talk concert is a first try because usually the, all the distinguished fellows uh, have the closed meeting, but you are so famous uh, fellows, so I want to open to meet the Korean people. So this is first opening try. And thank you again, the, uh, Professor uh, Sumu Ko and also uh, Professor Jino Choi, they are making these whole meetings. And also the, our speakers and panelists who will provide insightful guidance on the topic at hand. Uh, the Brain Link XLAB Day project was launched last year with a view to establishing research network at the global level while fostering uh, technology exchanges among eminent scholars, senior, and early career scientists and engineers. In 2022, the first Brain uh, Link X Lab Day hosted a total 14 technologies uh, and also with 449 uh, participants actively engaging in the event. This laid the foundation for successful networking uh, with many uh, scientists and engineers. This year, the uh, BrainLink XLAB Day will host 10 technology exchanges. You are the second group. And then in Gangwon province, because uh, if you do Seoul and then everybody's going out to be sightseeing, so we sent you to the Gangwon, is far from here. So maybe two hours driving or the you know uh, high speed railroad. Furthermore, we uh, have uh, arranged a special talk concert like today with speakers from the uh, BrainLink X Lab Day, aiming to extend the knowledge sharing uh, platform beyond in-depth exchange reserved for the select group of experts. That's why we had a closed meeting and an opening meeting today. As this year marks the second anniversary of its journey, I hope the excellent day will create a virtuous cycle structure that will eventually lead to a host of new global research opportunities in numerous technology fields. 
It is evident that 6G, the next generation communication technology, will serve as the fundam fundamental infrastructure for future industries, such as your autonomous vehicle and urban air mobility. Uh, personally, I'm doing research for the uh, house on the moon and Mars uh, over there. Mm -hmm. And I need definitely this communication on the moon and Mars. So I wish this technology going fast and we can use it. And so uh, given this uh, evolving landscape, I believe that it is both meaningful, meaningful and timely for the 2023 Brain Link X Lab Day to arrange technology exchange meetings under the theme of 6G semantic communications. I hope that the program will offer an opportunity to explore multiple aspects of this field and that the outcome of our discussion will contribute not only to personal growth but also the bolstering uh, Korea's competitiveness in advanced technology. I'm happy to the uh, this next year we had a big uh, financial budget for the global uh, collaboration together. So this is the first information for you guys. So next year you can you know meet the people and then we can make the uh, research collaboration together. It's a lot of big money. Another. Another one billion dollars. So, uh, 6G is a good topic, I think. So, uh, not only the, from uh, Korea to the uh, abroad, but also you are, you can come in and then to do research together. I hope uh, all of you having uh, taken time to join us for the Brain Link X Lab Day and talk concert. We will find this event to be a valuable networking opportunity. Uh, my heartful appreciation once again go to every participant involved in helping today's meeting who feel it's a mission. I wish you all the best in the future endeavors. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you again. Thank you, President. Let's give you a big hand. Okay. Uh, we will have a short break for five minutes. After that, we will have a panel discussion on semantic communication. Thank you. OK. Uh, let's start our panel discussion. Because the, we don't have enough time, I guess the 20 minutes. So we will have a panel discussion for 50 minutes. Uh, and uh, after that, we try to receive the, any question from the audience. OK? So uh, thank you, everybody. So thank you for your nice presentation. Though, even though the very short limited time. And the, also, first of all, I want to ask the one first question. So I think that we are only, we also working on the 6G and semantic communication, but uh, I guess we have a different trend for each country. So we want to share our thinking about the different, company tra uh, different country trend for 6G and the semantic communication. Uh, for the first uh, presenter, how about Jun? How about the idea of the Hong Kong and mainland China? Um, okay. Um, so, so the, the thing is that uh, because research uh, on 6G is uh, just beginning, right? Mm. Uh, so uh, there are, uh, in, in China, right? So in mainland China, actually there are lots of uh, different uh, attempts. Uh, so semantic communication is actually one of them, mm -hmm. a major one. Uh, some others, right? So say uh, also say millimeter wave terahertz, mm -hmm. and also about uh, satellite, right? So the, the satellite becomes more uh, more important. Um, so I, I have to say that the picture is not uh, very clear, clear yet. Okay, yeah. Uh, but we to, we, we do see that there are lots of room for research. Okay. So uh, okay, next, uh, Mehdi. So I know the. You are the key member of the 60 flagship in the old university. How about your opinion? Yeah, so we, we, I mean, as I said, we were the first, I mean, the world to launch, us, I mean, launch to, to, to start studying with 6G uh, back in 2018. At that time, people were making fun of us. You know, you guys are <laughs> starting to look at 6G. We don't even know what 5G is, right? But now, fast forward, everybody is talking about 6G. So for us, this is actually, so we started in 2018. So, you know, a few years uh, in, in the making. 
uh, from my personal view, we are still in the uh, kind of evolutionary uh, 5G. In short, there's nothing breakthrough-ish as far as I'm concerned. I see, of course, trends, terahertz, uh, sensing imaging, uh, very interesting, more than communication. We see edge AI, of course, uh, distributed edge intelligence. Uh, and then, of course, you see all the applications, XR, VR, uh, robotics. But these are, again, more use cases. There's no fundamental works that I, at least, uh, you know, I would push for. So it's, it's a bit blurry a picture, uh, maybe because I'm also interested maybe on more, let's say, fundamental, I don't know, topics. And it turns out semantic communication is definitely one of them. But we have more work to do. And uh, maybe it will take 10 years to, to push this topic. But uh, yeah, that's in short what okay. we are into. Thank you very much. And uh, let's take the turn to the Professor Adachi. And uh, I, would, I also want to know about the situation in Japan. How about the Japan? Uh, yes, uh, in Japan, uh, our government, MIC, uh, they invested uh, investing a lot of uh, research, uh, research uh, funding to uh, to the public uh, through the NICT. NICT is the uh, National Institute of uh, uh, Communication Technology. And uh, uh, since two years, uh, I don't remember correctly, uh, 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 I think uh, two years ago. And then uh, each year, uh, they accept the new proposals. And also the Hawaii University, Tohoku University, proposed the, uh, uh, two years ago uh, for beyond 5G. We don't say uh, 6G, uh, beyond 5G, including 6G. And uh, so the, again, uh, we are preparing the another uh, proposal to, uh, for the coming three years. So such kind of uh, huge uh, research uh, investment is uh, keep, uh, coming from the government. So they are investing a lot. And uh, also the uh, topics are uh, very wide, from uh, fundamentals to uh, applications. And our university is, pro uh, uh, say, proposing uh, physical layer. Mm. So uh, just I, uh, our group uh, submitted the proposals for next, uh, uh, starting from next year, uh, just uh, uh, begin, uh, Monday of this week. So uh, we'll uh, see the uh, results. Okay, so okay, this is our situation. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, uh, due to the limited time, I want to pass to the next question. So, as I know that six will be the key, uh, AI will be the key technology for the six G and the seven G, something like that. So, but uh, people have a different thinking how to apply the AI to the wireless communication system. It could be the evolutionary. It could be the revolutionary. What could be the idea? So, I want to ask the Professor Ji Hong Park. Okay, good but difficult question. <laughs> um, uh, we have had a dis uh, deep discussion in our session, closed session in Pyeongchang, and then uh, we uh, we all agree that it is not easy to reflect, uh, you know, all the AI native architecture and, sim and promising and emerging symmetric communication technologies for the next generation 6G centralization due to the limited time because the centralization has to be completed within a couple of years. But uh, uh, what we are discussing is still at a very preliminary stage. So um, my perspective, personal perspective is that uh, we may need to distinguish two different paths. One is evolutionary, the other one is a bit revolutionary. The thing is that when we, uh, do we think that uh, AI native architecture or semantic commentary technology can, uh, should be and can be applied for 6 years standardization? Then maybe not because of limited time. Within three uh, years as an example, as for short term. On the other hand, if we consider the, the communication in the era of 6G, in other words, 2030, then we may uh, consider uh, some new emerging technologies that will be happening in, in that age. For example, uh, OpenAI, Google, they are expecting that AGI uh, will be uh, hap happening and achieved within the fi five years. That is even earlier than 6G, the 2030. Then uh, we may also need to for that perspective, from that perspective, we may also need to start considering and preparing for these types, types of breakthroughs to be made in the era of 6G. So considering these two paths will be necessary in my opinion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. 
So also, I want to ask uh, Danilo, because Danilo is the mostly AI-oriented people. So how do you think it's, it could be the evolutionary, because the revolutionary? So, so I think uh, exactly the same of Jiang. So uh, I think that we definitely have the opportunity to uh, grow and so have uh, an evolutionary path. But uh, I think we need to be also open-minded to a uh, new revolution mm -hmm. because uh, it, it will happen very suddenly. And so we need to be prepared. And uh, AI offers a lot of opportunities. And uh, I think that uh, we can just think to emerging application, emerging opportunities, and be prepared to, uh, to, to address these uh, new opportunities and to have chance to make the also future revolution, so the future of communication. So we need to work on two paths to separate on, uh, immediately on the evolutionary path, but uh, we need to be prepared also for something new because we may, AI, uh, I definitely think that AI may expand the opportunity, not completely change, but uh, we can also uh, keep the same applications, the same things we do nowadays, but we may have the opportunities to uh, increase also our experience uh, in communication. Okay, thank you very much. I also agree with uh, your opinion that uh, we should be the open mind to accept uh, some new technologies such as LLM and the last ranking model. Okay, let's uh, pass to the next uh, question. So, everybody here, we are working on the semantic communication, but uh, most of it seems to be a little bit theoretical. So, what we need to think about the, what should be the key application of semantic communication? Uh, I want to give the first question to the Eleonora. Okay, th thanks for the question, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Not easy. <laughs> uh, no, I think so. I think that uh, um, there may be uh, very uh, important applications of semantic communication and uh, AI with semantic communication. And for sure, um, uh, remote control uh, or uh, um, uh, my connecting uh, machines and also uh, autonomous machines may surely uh, be of crucial imp importance or they will surely have a, a crucial role in this transformation and semantic communication may definitely uh, be uh, a core part of these applications. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, so how do you think Gino? Gino, I think the Australia is uh, very good at the military service the research. From that perspective, how do you think so? Yep, uh, so you are talking about the uh, defense applications uh. of the semantic communications, yep. right? Um, the, in uh, Australian defense, uh, robot and autonomous system is uh, one of the uh, key topics. And then uh, when I say uh, robots and then autonomous systems, you can imagine that how the, um, the situation in the world will be changed. So I mean, which already happened uh, uh, in the Ukraine world. So many things become so autonomous. And then uh, how do they effectively communicating with other autonomous systems? Uh, this is uh, one of the important issues. And then uh, we are somehow working with the defense uh, toward the, you know, that direction. So uh, because this is a very much like an initial phase, there's nothing much I can say that. But uh, uh, semantic communications are basically uh, you know, uh, to try to extract the intended meaning and deliver effectively uh, to the other end. So not only just limited to human uh, you know, uh, the communications, uh, also, the, uh, this is for the uh, machine communications, uh, including autonomous vehicles. Uh, so in defense, uh, uh, there is uh, you know, great use, uh, and then uh, depending on your imaginations, it can be good thing, it can be you know, uh, terrible things. So uh, I wouldn't you know, expand this view further, but uh, you can also find uh, a lot of the uh, you know, uh, utility of this idea, like as uh, uh, Eleonora mentioned, okay, uh, between the autonomous vehicles, so, or even uh, you know, you know, human to non-human communications. So there are lots of the applications of the 
uh, semantic communications, but the key is finding the intended meaning. So that, that is something uh, we need to rely on the AI. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, let's go to the next question. So I think so far semantic communication is too theoretical. So everybody rely on the, some, the computer simulation. But uh, Paul, make, to make a semantic communication more practical, what should we consider first? So I want to ask the Professor Fumiaki Adachi, because the, you are the physical layer people. How do you think so? Yes. Uh, uh, quite difficult. Uh, my, uh, because the wireless communications, uh, turn, uh, say propagation, mm -hmm. is quite, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, not uh, reliable and also not predictable. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the devices are fixed and stable, uh, then it's okay. But the problem is, it's uh, moving. Uh, for example, the human and uh, also the robots mm -hmm. uh, moving slowly. But uh, even slowly moving, the channel, propagation channel changes significantly, particularly if we uh, utilize the millimeter wave, for example, 28 gigahertz of 5G. And even, uh, I think, uh, 6G, more uh, higher than 28 gigahertz will be used. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, channel changes from time to time significantly. So then, uh, for the Shannon-based data communications, error, transmit, transmission error happens frequently. Uh, sometimes drops, uh, signal strength drops, and then abruptly uh, going up, and then uh, drops again. So such kind of uh, uh, very, very hostile channels uh, is the uh, problem. Okay. And how the uh, semantic communications uh, become so uh, resilient against such kind of hostile channels, that is important. So I think it is uh, 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 necessary to uh, develop uh, so resilient and uh, robust against uh, such kind of uh, uh, time-changing, uh, varying uh, channels. Okay. So for, for the time being, maybe uh, uh, many people assume the very uh, static or stable channels. So that's okay, but uh, in the real world, not. So you have to, uh, future, you have to check your algorithm. Uh, whether this works or not. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I think that Betty has uh, many ideas about it, some kind of challenging, and uh, what should we do first for semantic communication, for practical use? So your question was whether we should start from theory or we... Oh, it can be the theory, but uh, mm. to make a uh, semantic communication idea much more practical. Practical? So, I mean, yeah, it... because the, the, we have uh, many industry people in, mm. in this room, because the, that guy are uh, much interesting. Is it practical? Yeah, Is there I mean, real world? So I can give you many practical scenarios where you can claim to do semantic communication. If you put a video surveillance camera here, and of course you say, okay, I'm not communicating the raw data back to the cloud, I'm doing some sort of compression, uh, perceptual compression, or counting how many people here, extracting a summary, sending the summary to the cloud, that's semantic communication, and that's very practical, and maybe there are startups doing that. But I, I'm more interested in more, more, a bit more fundamental. Maybe can I, you know, as I said yesterday, a very nice use case for student sandbox environment is to combine multimodal sensing, fusion, communication, la large language models. Uh, 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 this idea of uh, the Professor Adashi mentioned. I think I'll, there's this key KPI I always keep mentioning, but because we are working on it a bit, but we haven't yet cracked it, is resiliency. Networks are not designed to be resilient. Mm -hmm. Resiliency is once your performance bounces goes down, you have to come back and sustain your performance. This is, I think, the most important KPI that 5G has no clue about, 6G even. But again, how do you formalize it? How do you measure it? I think it's a fundamental notion, which okay. is related to exactly uh, time-varying environment. You train in one environment, you test in a different one. Uh, again, resiliency, I think, is going to emerge as a killer requirement for 6G, but uh, let's see. Yeah. Okay, so it's an interesting opinion. Uh, due to the limited time, okay, let's take a turn to the audience. Uh, 혹시 질문 있으신 분 있으시면 질문해 주시면 
뭐 한국말로 하셔도 좋으니까 제가 그 전달하도록 하겠습니다. 혹시 질문 있으신 분 있을까요? Uh, thank you for uh, the talk. And I have a question from Professor Benis. So uh, you presented in System 2 semantic communication uh, this deeper understanding of uh, deeper and richer, um, let's say, representation of information and uh, like a topo topo topological um, representation of information. And um, that is a deeper, uh, more theoretical uh, view. And on the other hand, uh, we have these LLMs and uh, a lot of breakthrough uh, through image processing and uh, other areas. That, is, that are pushing the envelope. Uh, but uh, I realize that through the, um, the lens of the theory and the application, there is a huge gap. And it seems to me, filling this gap requires understanding the neural networks, how they uh, process information. And I, I know there has been some um, slow underst uh, understanding on how neural networks uh, operate. But I think, don't you think that understanding that deeper uh, representation of information requires understanding how really neural networks operate and how do they really uh, process data? Thank you. Yeah, it's a very important, important question, important comment, of course. So today we are just doing black box, okay? So in fact, uh, if you refer to the AI gurus, Bengio, Lequin, Hinton, they are trying, uh, they, they moved on. They moved on from system one. They are trying to work on system two, right? So they have this new concept of a joint uh, embedding predictive architecture, JEPA. So Yann Lecan is all about this. In fact, he keeps saying that for new students who want to do PhD, the best problem is hierarchical planning. Today, we don't have systems that can plan hierarchically, with hierarchy, right? How do you go from here to Incheon? That's my intent. How do I break it in terms of plans, subplans, achieve the goal, okay? Of course, what we want to do, do it in a distributed manner, and that's exactly where communication comes, right? But yes, you're absolutely right. There's a need to understand the problem is the area is moving too fast, LLMs now are taking over the hype, but people talk about LLM system one, system two. Today, LLMs don't understand anything, but sometimes they impress us, right? So, yeah, there's a need to, now I think, but it's difficult to pose Take time to study and understand what these LLMs are doing, but the problem we don't have that much time because they, <laughs> you know you're running against the the, the trend, right? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> okay. So my name is Dong Sung Won from ETRI. So. Thank you for your excellent presentation today. So uh, up to now is uh, 5, 5G communications. So we will live in the Shannon theory, Shannon information theory paradigms. But uh, my understanding about the uh, semantic communication is will be start different basis. So therefore, I would like to ask the panels who have uh, some special interest concerning about the semantic information theory. Shannon theory is basically mathematically foundations. But my understanding is semantic information theory is none, is not, exist. So if you have any specialties concerning about the semantic information theory, it's a current state of art or future research directions, any kind of things, could you tell me? Tough question, which maybe needs one hour. But uh, I was, as you were, my, 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 my brain was using maybe diffusion model to, to anticipate your question. I think a very good way to convince us uh, why we need a different, uh, in fact, we need to change the language. So Shannon theory is a language of random variables and probability theory, right? And we can use entropy and uh, measure uncertainty and so on. What some companies are pushing for Huawei in this case, and, and I think that's at least where we took the inspiration to, because they hired mathematicians, Nobel Prize winners to go deep. In fact, you have to change the language towards logic. So logic, you have to replace now random variables with propositions. 
you, you replace probability, you know, with maybe, you know, conjunctions of many, many, many logical propositions, and then information is not a scalar, as in Shannon, measured by entropy, but really it's living in this topological space, which has actually shapes and form. Famous French mathematician tells, you, actually tells us that actually using the word information is misleading. A better synonym will be form and shape. It's a very old uh, uh, French mathematician called uh, René uh, Thom. So forms, information is, is a form, is a shape, right? Now what's the equivalent of entropy, where you have to look at now at different notions in, as I told you over the break, to algebraic topology, you know, the notion of deforming one space into another, that's where you need to measure this ambiguity. The thing is, we don't have the theory yet, there are directions, nobody knows, but we certainly know at least make the difference between what we have to change the language. And our students are not used to this. They are, they are trained in the statistical world, which is a very tiny world, right? So I think this is gonna be five year, 10 year journey. Because if you manage to do this, maybe you can open a new Google. You will be able to t tell Bengio that actually he should maybe look at <laughs> semantic information theory to design new uh, architectures, new uh, algorithms, right? So that's my personal opinion. I think uh, also Jun can give some good answer about it because uh, you are studying some information, but like something like that. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, our approach, right? So uh, we uh, took the uh, information bottleneck as a framework to uh, make the problem uh, tractable. Uh, but it turns out that uh, those um, all days information theory can still help us, right? So, for example, uh, the information bottleneck for, uh, formulation, uh, if you uh, pick a special loss function in the uh, uh, previous uh, uh, source coding theory, uh, so you will see that they are equivalent. Uh, so this means that we can still learn something from a uh, classic information theory. But the problem actually is these days, uh, uh, indeed, there, 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 now there is a big gap between theory and the practice. Uh, but uh, um, no, nowadays, uh, the, the problem actually is, uh, for example, right, so we formulate the uh, objective as uh, this uh, mutual information. Um, but the problem is in, in these days, uh, the data is uh, um, so high dimensional, so complicated, so we do not know their distribution. Uh, so then even if we have uh, this kind of clean formulation, there is a gap to the uh, a practical solution, right? So how can we say estimate this uh, mutual information from data? So it's actually very difficult. Uh, so for me, I would actually take a more a pragmatic approach, right? So at the moment, uh, I think that it's too challenging to uh, say uh, rewrite information theory to develop something that's uh, specific for semantic communication. So let's actually start to work on something, build something, and from there, right? So probably we'll get uh, gradually we'll get more and more understanding about a problem, and then we may um, abstract it, right? So we may get some new theory from there. Thank you. Okay, you can have another question. Thank you for the, the answers. So, okay, so let's forget it about the, the semantic information theory. It's, uh, I would like to listen about some kind of words concerning about the future systems, maybe 6G, is currently based on the, we assume that the 5G. On top of that, is uh, we have put uh, 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 on the some kind of a cementing level. Okay? The cementing level, we uh, top on that, is uh, basically concept of the technical level or cementing level. In that case, is, uh, we have a, a kind of a synchronizations Knowledge synchronization is essentially. So, bad peripheral is uh, we in the mobile communication area. Mobile devices are wandering. In that case, uh, what is the way to synchronize the knowledge? Do you have any uh, understanding of our future concepts? Uh, let me know that. Jiyong, could you answer this question? Yeah, of course. That is a very good point. And, and yeah. Uh, AI native and or the semantic communication, machine learning based semantic communication technologies rely fundamentally on their knowledge. And then knowledge could be device uh, user specific. That should, should be heterogeneous. 
to just synchronize it is about if their knowledge is constructed based on neural network, then it's about distributed machine learning or distributed fine tuning of the neural network. We can apply some, some distributed machine learning techniques for fine tuning those types of approach. And in the, in the context of the, 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 the communication architecture, we have discussed in the, in the, in the, the last uh, close up sessions, and uh, perhaps the ORAN architecture might be useful for enabling uh, those types of exchanges using utilizing non real time and, and near real time uh, RICs so that they can store uh, some, some knowledge bases that includes neural network or other, there are other forms such as a symbolic graph and many others. And then they can compare and then synchronize or, or build a conceptual model so that it can be downloaded with each other. Or otherwise, one, even if they are storing different model parameters and different knowledge bases, it doesn't have to be always the same. As long as they uh, understand my, model, my knowledge is different from each other, then I can uh, change my way of speaking like, like humans. So that's, that can be enabled by utilizing such as uh, the large language model or many others. So that could be the future direction. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, actually, the, we don't have uh, enough time, so the, we hope to closing our panel discussion. Before that, we want to listen the closing remark, Professor Song Yoon Kim uh, at Yonsei University. Okay, so short summary. Uh, if you go back to your screen, uh, it was uh, yesterday. Uh, you know, uh, whiteboard. Uh, there are. Lots of questions uh, from from the participant, and we collect those questions and try to answer as much as possible. So our next plan is to publish a white paper uh, on semantic communications and 6G, perhaps, and would like to open uh, to the public and hope to have a co-authored uh, RCEE type of publications later on. Otherwise, uh, we have another uh, kind of uh, meeting in Globcom Kuala Lump. Uh, we have a workshop. So hope to see you again in, in Globcom. Uh, thank you, and you have a nice weekend. Thank you, Professor Kim. Uh, this is the end of our panel discussion. Thank you, everybody.